Morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on the recent changes to API's facility siting standards. I'm Stephanie. I'm your host today, and I'm glad you could all join us. Um, as you know, the reason you're here, the American Petroleum Institute recently issued updates to its facility siting standards, recommended practices 752, 753, and 756, covering the management of hazards associated with the location of process plant permanent buildings, portable buildings, and tents, respectively. Uh, whether you're a safety professional and engineer or just someone keen on understanding the intricacies of facility safety, this webinar will offer an overview of the updated standards, essential changes, and the potential approaches to align with the new guidance. Uh, so before we begin, I want to encourage you all to actively participate in today's session. We value your questions and insights, um, so feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar using the Zoho webinar Q&A box. Uh, we'll be addressing your questions during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We are recording this webinar and we'll make the recording available within the next week. Uh, we'll send that out in an email. And if you'd like a PDH certificate, send us an email at contact at AccutechConsulting.com to request one. I'll put that in the chat. It'll be on the, the last slide as well. Um, and we'll be happy to send one to, to anyone who's in attendance for the live webinar. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers who will be guiding us through today's standard review. Um, we have Colin Armstrong and Rich McQuinn, both uh, of whom bring a wealth of knowledge and experience in the field of facility siting. Colin is a principal engineer and group lead for our quantitative risk services group. He's been the technical lead for numerous facility siting and QRA projects in oil and gas, LNG, and specialty chemical industries. And he serves on the API facility siting committee that covers these standards. Uh, Rich is a senior engineer with expertise in QRA and facility siting analyses and consequence modeling. So I hope you're ready for a practical review of the changes and their implications for siting studies from our experts. Um, and now I'll pass the virtual mic to Colin to kick off our webinar. Actually, uh, yes, Steph, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, go through the agenda today. So thanks, Steph, for the introductions and thank you everyone for attending. So today's webinar will focus on an overview of the changes and new additions to API's facility siting standards. The, the key topics we'll cover today are the guiding principles and hierarchy of controls, buildings that require siting evaluation and protection features, updates to the facility siting process, hierarchy of occupant and building protection concepts, new guidance and definitions regarding building fire and toxic protection concepts, specifically evacuation and refuge, siting of portable buildings and lightwood trailers that are made permanent, updating uh, updated zoning requirements for portable buildings and how the siting evaluation should address the risk to temporary workers. So first we'd like to move on to a short poll for everybody. Uh, what we'd like to ask is, uh, with the publication of the new facility siting RAGAGAP, uh, API RP 752, 753, and 756, which of the following aspects are most relevant to your business? So we have here a risk, risk assessment, which um, API has specified uh, new assessment methodologies that may require existing siting studies to be updated. There may be potential cost implications to complying with these new requirements, which can involve updating the siting study, developing procedures and emergency response plans, and making changes to the facility process. Operations may be impacted as well when implementing changes to procedures and training programs. Site resources may need to be allocated to meet these additional requirements, and stakeholders may be engaged to communicate these new requirements and address any concerns. So I'll give everybody a minute to uh, submit your answers, and then we'll take a look at the poll results in a couple minutes.
Okay, it looks like most votes have come in at this point. Maybe give folks another 10 seconds and then uh, we'll we'll look at the results. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully everyone can see these results here. Looks like uh, top of mind for most folks is going to be the risk assessment process. So that's why we're all here, where we want to know what's new about the risk assessment process. So um, that, that's going to be our main focus today. Uh, next are operational impacts, which makes sense as well. So, you know, how, how can operations change um, based on these new requirements? You know, we'll, we'll go through that as well. So uh, like, like I mentioned, most of the changes um, operationally may be in, involving developing of procedures and emergency response plans, and, and you may, maybe there may be some changes to the, the general facility process. And then next, the, the third, third item is cost implications. So that's always on, on the minds of facilities. So uh, you know, when complying with these new requirements and, and, and developing these, these new procedures and documentation, there's always going to be some sort of cost associated with that. So, so we'll try to call these items out during the course of the presentation as well, since these are the, the main topics that, fo that folks uh, are wanting to, to learn about. So now I'll then hand it over to Colin to discuss the guiding principles and the hierarchy of controls. Thank you, Rich. So we're going to start at the really top of the API standards, which are the guiding principles and now the new hierarchy of controls that are really overarching across the standards. These have now been harmonized across API recommended practices 752, 753, and 756. Um, and just to circle around um, to make sure everybody's on the same page, API 752 applies to permanent board buildings, API 753 applies to portable buildings, and API 756 applies to uh, tents. So these guiding principles have now been harmonized across all three standards, and the hierarchy of controls here is new. And the reason we really want to focus on this, the guiding principles haven't changed that much here, but there is a lot of added reference to these guiding principles throughout the standards uh, that was not there previously. And often we are now directed back to these guiding principles as part of the siting evaluation. The first two guiding principles really go hand in hand, and that's to locate personnel away from process areas uh, consistent with safe operations and minimize the use of buildings or tents in proximity to those process areas. The third guiding principle here has been expanded. That's to manage the occupancy of buildings and tents in close proximity to process areas. And the new part is that um, it's called out that we especially needed to manage this during abnormal operations. So things like turnaround, SIM ops, uh, construction, maintenance activities, where we may have additional personnel or temporary personnel in proximity to process areas. Um, and the fourth and fifth guiding principles are to design, construct, install, and manage uh, the installation and use of buildings uh, to protect occupants uh, and manage the operation and emergency response at the facility. So these guiding principles are reflected in the new hierarchy of controls that we see on the right side of the slide here. And we'll note that that starts with eliminating the occupancy or the hazard, and that's consistent with the primary uh, principles of inherently safer design. Um, as we go through, we see that then reducing the occupancy or the severity of the hazard or reducing the risk uh, is the next control measure in that hierarchy. And as we go down, we see increasing the distance, which by fact uh, reduces the hazard and increasing the resistance of the building or administratively controlling the occupancy is there um, towards the bottom. So take a minute to note the order here. We have elimination or reduction of the hazard or the risk at the top of the hierarchy. And often in the past, um, that could be overlooked in facility siting that the um, most impactful change that could be made is to eliminate or reduce the risk itself um, before we go to look at you know, simply uh, moving the building or increasing the resistance of a building to a hazard. There have been a variety of updates made throughout section four. Um, 
it's very clearly stated that occupied buildings shall be evaluated and they shall be evaluated as stated in the new standards if the building could be impacted by a credible explosion flammable vapor release thermal radiation or toxic material release and if the building could be impacted a siting evaluation shall be conducted for each of those hazards so um, it's reiterated very clearly in the standard um, that all of these hazards uh, are required to be considered and evaluation is required if the building could be impacted by that hazard type. So this all relates back to the risk assessment process, uh, which I think was the focus we saw from the poll. All of these risks need to be evaluated uh, in the siting evaluation process. These requirements have been clarified in further sections uh, 7, 8, and 9, which apply to explosions, fires, and toxics specifically. So we see it specifically stated that siting for explosions shall be conducted if personnel in a building may be impacted, not accounting for the protective features, and that text is new. For fire, siting, shall, uh, siting evaluation shall be conducted if the building could be impacted by credible flammable vapor release or thermal radiation. There's been expanded guidance on the evaluation of fire hazards, which Rich will talk to a little later. And siting for toxics shall be conducted if the building could be impacted by an acute toxic level of concern, ERPG3 or AGL3, which are potentially lethal uh, toxic vapor concentrations, are given as examples of toxic levels of concern. And these siting evaluations shall be conducted Again, not accounting for special design features of the building, which may protect those occupants. Um, what we see are that these statements clarify that protection features shall not preclude the building from being evaluated in the siting evaluation, uh, but rather the evaluation must be conducted to identify and document the protection features. And finally, um, there are statements in each of the sections uh, for explosion, fire, and toxics, which state that the other hazards must be considered as well. So when we evaluate um, a building for blast impacts, it's specifically stated now that we shall also consider fire and toxic along with that. And the reason being here is that we need to consider multiple hazards and multiple hazards could be present simultaneously in an emergency event. If a blast hazard impacts a building, it may degrade that building's ability to withstand fire or toxic consequences that may occur along with that hazard. So there's also been some further clarification uh, in the process and the management of facility siting around the evaluation. Um, it's specifically stated now that controls shall be implemented to ensure the use of buildings not intended for occupancy does not change to buildings intended for occupancy. So those um, control or those buildings which we do not include in the siting evaluation, we need to ensure now it's required that we have controls in place uh, to ensure that those do not become buildings intended for occupancy. Uh, so this may be in the form of signage, periodic audits at the facility to ensure that the occupancy of those buildings does not change over time. Um, it is now stated specifically that owners shall establish siting criteria for new and existing buildings. So we need to do a siting evaluation and evaluate the potential impacts, but it's required that a criteria be set um, to determine whether that siting is acceptable or unacceptable. And finally, it's stated that protection features used to meet the criteria shall be documented, monitored, and maintained. So any protection features, as we talked about, that we cannot uh, use to preclude the building from the siting evaluation, um, if we do consider them when we evaluate the building, those need to be documented, monitored, and maintained to ensure continued safety of building occupants. All right, so I'm going to hand it over now to Rich, who's going to talk a bit in more detail about the new guidance in the siting evaluation process. Evaluation. 
I'm sorry, Rich. There's a, a sound issue coming in on your end now that wasn't there previously. Okay, let me. Um, That's better. Okay. Let me just um, adjust my mic here. All right. So um, the siting evaluation process starts similarly for assessing the three hazard types, which are the fire, explosion, and toxic hazards, as and ask the question, could the building be impacted? If, the, if building impact is not possible, then no evaluation is required, and the study can proceed to the final step of implementing procedural controls. If building impact is possible, then the evaluation must consider if building placement is in accordance with the guiding principles. From there, the evaluation follows a method to assess building impacts specific to the hazard type. First, we'll move on to the evaluation of fire and toxic hazards. The siting evaluation process for the fire and toxic hazards follows a similar approach. So I'll discuss these evaluation steps together. There are, are some differences for how explosions are evaluated since the main concern is uh, the blast impacts for explosions. So therefore, the explosion evaluation follows a slightly different assessment approach. Uh, for fire and toxic, the next step of the evaluation are determining if the building could be impacted. And, the, and then if the building could be impacted, the, then proceed to the selection of the protection concept and assessment of the impact against the general criteria. For fire, this uh, typically is generalized spacing table approach, and for toxic, a building can be assumed to exceed the criteria. If the general criteria is exceeded, then the siting study must quantitatively determine impacts due to fire or toxic exposure, considering whether the building is new or existing. Based on the building status, whether it's new or existing, appropriate criteria must be defined and building design must meet the criteria. The requirements for the quantitative analysis have been updated and expanded and now includes determining adverse effects to the building and or determining occupant vulnerability to the hazards. Now just note here that both of these are not required, so you can do one or the other. Now moving on to the evaluation of explosion hazards. The next step for evaluating um, explosions is to after you determine if the building can be impacted is to quantitatively determine the blast loads onto the building. Like the fire and toxic evaluation, the requirements for quantitative analysis for explosions have been updated and expanded and now includes the building's response to blast loads and occupant vulnerability. Design criteria must be defined for the building, considering whether the building's new or existing. After performing the analysis, we're ready to move on to the final steps of the siting evaluation. In these final steps, API has specified additional requirements in addition to managing the uh, building occupancy and or management of change that was in the, the previous requirement. The final steps of the siting evaluation now include reviewing the building siting against guiding principle four, which Colin discussed early on, documenting the siting evaluation and then revalidating the siting study periodically. In the next slide now, I'll discuss the new definitions for refuge. So now API RP752 has uh, provided the, the hierarchy of uh, occupant and building protection that is similar to the hierarchy of controls that Colin discussed previously. So, so this hierarchy of building protection can be found in Annex C2. Previously, the um, hierarchy of mitigation measures was included in uh, the third edition of 752, um, but now in, in the new fourth edition, these have been expanded to include the, um, the building protection as well. So these building protection concepts are presented in the order of most effective to least effective. The most effective protection concept is evacuation, which is analogous to eliminating the hazard within the hierarchy of controls. 
if building occupancy, uh, if it, sorry, if building occupants can safely evacuate the building, egress and muster at a safe location, then exposure to the hazard would be eliminated. Next are refuse concepts, which with, with the most effective being a safe haven and the least effective being a shelter of opportunity. In the next slide coming up, I'll discuss uh, these uh, new refuge definitions that have been added to API RP752. Okay, so in facility siting, a refuge plays a crucial role in ensuring the safety of individuals during emergencies. A refuge in the context of facility siting refers to a designated area where people can seek protection from fire and toxic hazards. The following definitions have been added to API RP752 for the different types of fires and tox toxic refuges to consider in facility siting. First, we have safe haven, which is an engineered refuge designed to protect building occupants from fire and or toxic hazards to a specified level. For example, to withstand fire impingement for 15 minutes. These refuges are equipped with building features that protect building occupants during emergencies. An example of this would be a fire resistant wall between the process and occupied area to mitigate the fire impacts to personnel. Next are shelter in place refuges. So unlike safe havens, shelter in place locations are not specifically engineered for prolonged shelter. This refuge is designed to protect building occupants from initial impacts of the emergency event and can provide, for example, additional isolations from hazards by allowing occupants to take actions such as closing the doors, windows, and shutting off HVAC systems. So this is more of a, a temporary uh, protection rather than something prolonged like a safe haven. Next, in, in the cases where safe haven or shelter in place locations are not available and then hazard hazardous exposure is imminent, certain structures can serve as non-toxic or non-fire refuges. Examples of this refuge type include upper stories of buildings or internal rooms that are not specifically designed to resist the hazards to a specified level, but can offer temporary protection from hazardous exposure. As a last resort and supplement to the emergency response plan, personnel can be trained to seek shelters of opportunity when they are unable to escape from toxic or fire hazards. This may involve, for example, utilizing closed vehicle cabins or other spaces for temporary protection when no other refuge option is available. Understanding the, the different types of refuges is essential for effective facility siting and emergency preparedness. By incorporating the appropriate refuge options into facility site design and emergency plans, the safety and well-being of on-site individuals can be enhanced. Now, I'd like to move on to API's guidance regarding the protection concepts. So now API provides expanded guidance for, cons for consideration when selecting a protection concepts. Since there are parallels in guidance for fire and toxic protection concepts, I'll discuss them together. In general, selecting a pr protection concepts involves understanding the nature of a hazard considering both immediate and time dependent fire and or toxic hazards to develop credible design point scenarios. Based on the hazard and its potential to impact the buildings, facilities can choose evacuation concept, the refuse concept, or a combination of both. This combination concept is new to API RP752. For fire, API provided additional guidance around factors influencing the severity of impact to support the selection of a protection concept, which I'll explain further uh, in, in the coming slides. For a toxic release, the hazard of concern is acute health effects. So the analysis needs to consider if toxic material concentrations or exposure durations may adversely impact building occupants. Once a protection concept is selected, appropriate emergency response and building protection measures must be provided for the building to ensure safety of building occupants. With the protection concepts in mind, I'd like to move on now to discuss the fire hazards that could lead to potential building impact. Uh, within sections 8.3 to 8.5 of API RP752 is now provided uh, expanded guidance on the different types of fire hazards and specific impacts to consider in facility siting that may impair a, an occupied building and potentially harm building occupants. 
while there are no specific requirements in these sections, uh, these are important considerations for performing the siting analysis. Types of fire to consider typically include pool fire, jet fire, fireball, flash fire, and vapor cloud explosion. Each of these fire types has a specific impact profile, so API has now provided the uh, types of fire impacts to consider, which include flame impingement, thermal radiation, flux or dose, convection thermal flux or dose, pressure, and momentum. So these are the, the typical fire types and fire impacts assessed in the facility siting evaluation. Moving on now to the hazards associated with the types of fire are uh, now provided now in these hazard categories with associated applicable fire types. Hazards can be categorized as immediate hazards and time-dependent hazards and hazards during evacuation. Immediate hazards are applicable for most of the fire types. The, these hydro, uh, hydrocarbon fires especially can generate high thermal radiation quickly and ignite buildings. High pressure jet fires have significant momentum, which can cause windows to fail and then the fire to enter the building. Time dependent hazards include toxic fumes, temperature rise, ignition of building, uh, structural failure, and ingress of smoke and combustion products. These time dependent hazards will influence building occupant vulnerability for long duration events and may require additional building protection measures to prevent building impairment, such as uh, features to prevent ingress of hazardous gas. Hazards may also be present during evacuation. Facilities should be aware of potential impairment of evacuation routes from flame contact, high thermal radiation, or thermal dose for personnel egressing, and must provide mitigation measures to protect evacuation routes. Uh, regarding toxic exposure, which is not on this slide, these, these types of exposures and uh, hazards can be evaluated similarly, considering immediate hazards, such as a con uh, exposure to high concentrations, time-dependent hazards, such as a toxic dose over time, and evacuation hazards. Now I'd like to move on to discuss the new guidance for the evacuation concepts. So API has as well expanded guidance for the fire and toxic evacu evacuation concepts, with now a greater emphasis on emergency response planning. Here, the text in blue indicates the new language in API RP752. Operators shall now provide additional emergency response features, which include evacuation drills as part of emergency action procedures, an emergency action plan directing personnel to a refuge point or muster point, a means for personnel to communicate with emergency responders, which is particularly important because sometimes the uh, communication can break down between uh, personnel and emergency responders. And when that happens, the you know it's very difficult to try to manage the uh, the emergency and then and can keep track of, of all the personnel. Also, there needs to be a means of determining the wind direction to help the occupants egress safely to a refuge or muster point. And then API has per also provided additional examples of mitigation measures to protect the evacuation routes and minimize potential exposure to personnel, such as providing some sort of uh, thermal shielding or water curtains to, to, to minimize uh, the severity of potential hazards. Operation, operators should also consider uh, the, the capability of the building to resist these fire and, and toxic hazards to provide the time necessary for building occupants to safely egress. Overall, the, the uh, fire and and toxic evacu evacuation concepts have been expanded to emphasize the emergency response planning and safe evacuation. Uh, now moving on, I'd like to discuss the uh, refuge concepts within API. So here, the their API has provided expanded guidance for fire and toxic refuge concepts, now with a greater emphasis on determining protection requirements specific to the hazards that can impact the building and they also provided more uh, guidance on building protection features and, and uh, requirements for informing personnel of the hazards. Again, the blue text here indicates the new language within the standards. New requirements for fire refuge include the design performance requirements that have to be based on the time occupants are required to remain within the, thresh, uh, within the refuge and the duration of the flammable material or fire impedance. Building features, um, 
should be included to prevent the infiltration or formation of smoke or flammable mixture within the building. Operators must also inform building occupants of the, these uh, building policies and procedures, emergency response plan, and, and um, the emergency response plan also must be posted within the building as well. So there, there's now these um, additional requirements to inform personnel within the building and to make sure everybody understands what the plan is if there is some sort of hazard impacting the building. Moving on now to the, refuge, the, the toxic refuge concept, which is uh, quite similar to the, the fire refuge concept. API has provided now these requirements for the toxic refuge, which include, inf again, informing the building occupants of these policies and procedures for emergency response planning, and then also must post this emergency response plan within the building. Uh, regarding the toxic concept, uh, refuge concept, there are a number of additional should statements that provides guidance for toxic refuges. An important one to note is that if the material is flammable, in addition to being toxic, like Holly mentioned in an earlier slide, the siting evaluation must also consider the fire effects, such as um, explosion damage that may compromise the build, building's performance as a toxic refuge. Overall, the fire and toxic refuge concepts have been expanded and harmonized, as you can see in this side-by-side uh, -side comparison, which and includes now additional shall statements and should statements. Now I'd like to turn it back to Colin to go through the new requirements within API RP 753. All right, thank you, Rich. Um, API 753 handles portable buildings and there's clarification now in the new API uh, recommended practice 753 regarding uh, portable buildings that may be used permanently at facilities. Um, it's now clarified that all portable buildings intended to be movable and all light wood trailers are to be covered under API 753, whereas new and existing portable buildings other than light wood trailers intended for perpetual use in a specific location are covered by API 752. So what this really means is that any light wood trailer uh, brought onto the site, whether it's permanent or portable, uh, whether it's to be located in a location permanently, like we see in the photograph here on the uh, right side of the slide where a light wood trailer has been uh, placed permanently in a location, or whether it's to be moved, it is covered under API 753 and not API 752. Uh, previously, it could have been interpreted to cite a light wood trailer that is located permanently under API 752, um, where we see that new and existing portable buildings um, that will be cited permanently can be covered under API 752. So if we were to bring on site, let's say, a metal container building or a portable blast resistant module located permanently at the facility uh, for or permanent occupancy, that would be cited under API 752. So if we want to summarize, if a portable lightwood trailer is brought on site, it will always be considered as a portable lightwood trailer, regardless of whether it is to be located permanently or temporarily. And so now we'll discuss a bit more some of the new uh, zoning methods and limits for portable buildings and lightwood trailers under API 753. Um, so for portable buildings and lightwood trailers, there's a new explicit requirement that within 330 feet of hazard sources, these could be congested volumes that are the source of vapor cloud explosions, as we've often talked about within previous versions of API 753, or uh, sources of fire or flammable release that could present a fire hazard to API 7 to build it to the portable building at the location. And within that 330 foot standoff distance, non essential personnel shall not be assigned. And that is a new shell statement um, specifically to this 330 foot standoff distance. It is reinforced that the risk based approach shall not be used to site lightwood trailers or non essential personnel in a portable building uh, within zone one. So 
um, again, we cannot use a detailed risk-based analysis here to circumvent this 330-foot standoff distance. It is fixed. It is um, absolute. And the requirements shown in the table here uh, shall be used regardless of which zoning method, A or B, and we'll talk about those new zoning methods, which are similar to the old zoning methods in the next slide. But these requirements uh, shall be used. So within zone one, lightwood trailers are not allowed. Again, that's regardless of whether we do a risk-based analysis. Um, portable buildings uh, need a siting evaluation and may only house non-essential or may only house essential personnel. Non-essential personnel are not allowed. As we go to zone two, lightwood trailers and all portable buildings require siting evaluation. And we need to evaluate and consider the occupancy against the requirements of section six, which essentially we'll see in a couple of slides, the flow chart associated with that, but it essentially requires us to consider back to the guiding principles. Um, is the occupancy consistent with those guiding principles? As we move out to zone three, the farthest from the hazards, there are no restrictions for lightweight trailers or other portable buildings. But again, we still need to consider that occupancy against those guiding principles as is listed in section six. So here we see two zoning methods, um, and these are analogous to the previous uh, simple and detailed zoning methods under API 753. Zoning method A uses the same chart uh, from the previous version of API 753 to set um, the standoff distances for zone one, zone two, and zone three uh, from congested regions for uh, blasts. We see that if we use this chart, there is a uh, there is a minimum of 330 feet going all the way down to a zero cubic foot congested volume. Dependent on the size of our congested volume, that standoff distance then increases. And this is applicable up to congest for congested volumes up to a volume of 1 million cubic feet. And you can see the zone two, zone three boundary. Uh, changes there as well based on the size. Zoning method B is the more detailed uh, analysis using VCE modeling and may incorporate uh, risk-based analysis uh, to define the 0 0.9 PSI and 0 0.6 PSI contours uh, for the zone 1, 2 and zone 2, 3 boundaries. However, as we noted, there is still a minimum 330-foot standoff distance for that zone one, two, and zone two, three boundary. So the same 330 foot minimum is applicable for both zoning methods A and B. So let's consider this uh, with an example image, which comes from the new API 753 annex. Um, here we see. Uh, a zone one contour that's been set based on these three congested volumes. And we see some zone two contours overlaid and the overall zone two highlighted here in gray and zone three out here. Out here, we have no restrictions for occupancy. This zone one, two boundary, if that was set using a detailed analysis to define a 0 0.9 PSI contour, we do now need to check and make sure there's still a 330 foot standoff distance from these congested volumes to the limit of that zone one uh, boundary. Um, our buildings still have to be outside of that zone one boundary. That zone one boundary needs to be considered out to that minimum 330 foot standoff. If we were citing a building in zone two, um, that's acceptable as long as we're outside of this 330 foot boundary to the congested volume, but we must also consider uh, that 330 foot standoff distance to any other fire or flammable release hazard sources. So if we have, for example, other potential uh, flammable hazards outside of these congested volumes, we would still need to consider that 330 foot standoff distance for those as well. We also need to compare the occupancy back to the guiding principles. You can see, even if we are outside of this 330 foot standoff distance, the next step is to consider uh, if the building occupancy is in accordance with the guiding principles, 
and then that needs to be documented uh, and implement uh, the management of the building occupancy and or management of change. Again, those refer back to all of the uh, items we talked about in previous slides, which are now referenced throughout all of these processes. API 753 and API 756, which evaluate per portable buildings and tents, which are used on a temporary basis, um, does address the risk to portable, or sorry, does address the risk to um, temporary workers. These structures are temporary in nature, and thus, you know, we have temporary workers on site that we're evaluating the siting of. Um, it is stated specifically now that when using a risk-based approach for siting portable buildings and tents, um, that the individual risk calculation shall assume an occupancy of at least 40 hours a week by an individual for the entire year, and no credit shall be taken uh, when calculating the individual risk for buildings that will not be used or located at the site for an entire year that will be used for less than a year. Um, the, it is noted that for aggregate risk, the expected occupancy hours and cumulative duration of usage on a weekly or annual basis may be considered. So let's um, discuss briefly why this is. Um, when we have temporary workers at the site who may be exposed to uh, risk from the process, if we used that temporary period to, um, let's say, reduce the risk ex to take a, a credit for a reduced overall risk exposure through the year, we may not be considering that those temporary workers are exposed to risk at other facilities when not working at uh, the facility in question. So if each operator allowed elevated risk to temporary workers um, be by taking credit for this shorter period, the result may be that those temporary workers who move from site to site throughout the year are over the course of the year exposed to elevated risk as compared to permanent workers at facilities. So we need to ensure that each facility is not contributing more than its prorated share of the risk to these temporary workers who may be moving site to site. Now for the aggregate risk, that's considering uh, the site's overall risk profile throughout a year we can control the occupancy within the facility and control how many people are in certain risk zones throughout the year and thus can take credit for that uh, within those aggregate risk calculations. But again, for the workers that are coming on site, we need to make sure that their individual risk throughout the year is not elevated. So in summary, API's expanded guidance and added a lot of clarifications and provided additional details to many of the existing requirements. And there are new shell statements, new requirements added regarding determining buildings requiring evaluation, defining siting criteria, evaluating building response to the hazards, not taking account for protection concepts, uh, requirements to document control measures that are considered in the siting analysis, and for planning uh, emergency response. Requirements for citing portable buildings and addressing risks to temporary workers have been clarified or changed. The um, evaluation of light wood trailers is uh, specifically required to be evaluated now under API 753, and the 330 foot standoff distance is mandated therein. And it is added in now that operators may need to revalidate these siting studies and update site procedures to meet new requirements. So at this point, I know we've reached our uh, time, but for those of you who want to hang around for some uh, questions or want to submit some questions, we've had a couple of them come in here. If you have any questions at this time, please do submit those through the Q&A option in the webinar window. And we can start with a couple that are already here. I'll turn it over to you, Steph. Yeah. I think you're muted, Steph. We can't hear you. Can't hear you. Um, all right, let's start with this one. Does the standard define which protection features must be documented? 
That is, yeah. so uh, the protection features, as we saw in one of the initial slides, it's stated now that protection um, features shall be documented, monitored, and maintained. Um, interesting to note, these protection features, generally people would think of protection features associated with the building. If the building is a blast hardened building, if it has uh, HVAC shut down to mitigate toxic vapor ingress, maybe it has a positive pressure uh, control system, um, those building protection features, uh, yes, need to be documented, monitored, and maintained. But it should also be uh, noted here, consistent with the hierarchy of controls that we touched on at the beginning, um, there's a preference for eliminating or reducing the risk of the process. That gives us benefits not only to mitigating impacts to specific buildings, but it mitigates the risk to the business, to people outdoors. Um, protection measures associated with reducing process risk, things like gas detection, emergency isolation, emergency depressurization, safety instrumented systems, those may be protection features that are considered in the siting study as well. And those would also need to be documented, monitored, and maintained. It's really consistent with the overall uh, PHA approach, um, which if you're within the US under OSHA PSM, facility siting is addressed under the PHA uh, element of process safety management. Two, maybe one more question. Uh, is there a date that plants will need to meet these new guidance requirements? So, yeah, I can, I can uh, take this question. So, um, basically, API has, has published these um, new, new uh, standards in January. So, basically, um, the, in, uh, the industry has given um, or is, has been provided about six months to you know review these uh, new updates and requirements and digest it so in in june uh, of this year june 2024 that's when um uh i guess re regulators osha's will start to assess the facility siting issues uh, against these updated protocols so to specifically answer the question june june 2024 will be when you know osha and psm will be looking towards these new standards and then assessing uh, requirements based on these new standards. Yeah, that may be different outside of the U.S., obviously. Right. That's right. US yeah, outside of the U.S. could be, um, you know, the different timeline. But um, I would say uh, for facilities to um, to keep that date in mind is that that's when you'll, you'll want to transition your uh, facility signing methodologies to, to utilize these new standards. see a couple questions here about getting a copy of the slides. Uh, yes, we'll send out the recording and slides in the next few days. Um, Colin Rich, do you want to answer one more question? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, all right, let's do this last one. Uh, do all of those protection features need to be documented in the same document or is having it in the PHA or the facility siting? Um, you are adequate. There's no defined location where that must be documented. Um, so that's going to be up to the site how they would want to document that dependent on their PHA and facility siting program. Um, generally, it would it would make, you know, one of one thing that needs to be considered is those protection features that are considered in the facility siting study need to, should be documented in that facility siting report um, so that that information is readily available. Remember, you know, we want, uh, we always want things to be auditable. Uh, when we develop documentation, um, you know, as make that in a way that we, uh, if you were an auditor, it, you'd easily be able to find that information. So that's the guidance. Uh, generally that I would choose, so. Um, thank you. Um, so there you have it. We hope that this overview of the changes was helpful to you. Um, I want to extend our gratitude to Colin and Rich for sharing their expertise. Um, and to each and every one of you who are joining us today, your active participation in the poll and the questions made this engaging. 
Um, we value your questions, so if you have any more, please send it at the email that you see on the screen here. And uh, like I said, we'll be sending out a link to the recorded webinar once it's available. Feel free to revisit the content, share it with your colleagues, or just delve deeper into the insights we provided today. If you need a PDH certificate, uh, please also email us at contact at AccutechConsulting.com. And so again, big thank you to the speakers, to all of you for being a part of the conversation, and we look forward to connecting with you again in future webinars. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everyone.